Good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm here for, um, to introduce our wonderful speakers for this morning. Uh, the first one is Dr. Ina Kupreva. She's a senior lecturer in ancient philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, she has a BA and an MA uh, from Moscow State University and has a PhD at the University of Toronto. She's been in, Edim in Edinburgh uh, since 2005, and before that she has had research positions at King's College London and Oxford, and also has been around in many Canadian universities sharing her knowledge of ancient philosophy. Um, the title of her talk is Conceptualizing Space, Place, Location, and Dimensions in Ancient Greek Philosophy. So uh, I was asked to have a brief introduction in, to ancient philosophy of space in the space of about 30 minutes. And um, well, uh, it is difficult, but I think it is possible to tell uh, at least a short story of uh, how people in uh, the ancient world thought about space and uh, more specifically how philosophers in ancient world uh, thought about space. Philosophers in ancient world, as you will see, are not very different from us. They are also asking difficult questions, are trying to find rigorous answers. Sometimes they're failing, sometimes they're disagreeing with each other. And it all begins with a famous man called Hesiod. I'm pretty sure you all know about him. I, I also apologize for the abundance of irrelevant uh, um, images in my talk. Most of this is art, but some of this will be a little bit technical. So uh, Hesiod, uh, in his, uh, one of his great poems, two great poems, which is called Theogony, uh, describes uh, how the, everything comes to be, and the first entity to come to be is called chaos. Chaos is not what we think uh, it is. It is not like a mess, but uh, chaos in Greek language means something like a gap. So it is uh, a chasm, and uh, Aristotle, in his uh, book of physics, compares correctly, I think, uh, chaos to space even though it is, of course, a very rudimentary and poetic concept of space. But it's still significant that uh, space, construed as initial chasm and gap from which everything comes to be, is uh, the first entity in uh, philosophical uh, th uh, theology of the ancient Greeks. After the theological poetry, we move to the uh, early philosophers, and the earliest philosophical school in Greece is the philosophical school in uh, uh, Miletus. And here we have a very nice picture. I just like the, just look at how the man is sitting and taking notes. He is an Aximander of Miletus. This is from Raphael's famous uh, 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 depiction of ancient Athenian, actually, school of philosophy. And uh, this Anaximander is responsible for the introduction of what is often uh, regarded as the first abstract concept of uh, natural philosophy. This is, uh, he is a member of a very active, very, very uh, vibrant intellectual team of Milesian philosophers. The first is Thales of Miletus. Everyone knows Thales because there is a theorem of Thales. <laughs> and uh, these are all very, very uh, um, educated, highly intelligent, political, uh, worldly men. And they are really doing philosophy, maybe in their spare time, but still it seems that they attach quite a great importance to this occupation. They also serve as political advisors, so these are intellectuals of, of their own age. And uh, they just offer various hypotheses of what the world might have come from, maybe water, maybe air. And Aximander says that maybe it is neither water nor air, but some kind of originative material, which also has some spatial properties. In fact, the very name of this originative material, apeiron, means, um, often it's translated as infinite, we should translate as unlimited, indefinite, because it should indicate that it has no definite qualitative properties, and at the same time, it is placed by Anaximander at uh, the uh, place of principle in his system. All the other things, water, air, and so on, come from this indefinite material through a very intricate mechanism of transformations uh, from opposites. So uh, Anaximander is uh, somebody who probably is the precursor of our uh, modern physics in some sense. But then 
Anaximander and other physiologists had a big challenge from a man who uh, really uh, sort of um, threatened the whole concept of theoretical physics because the concept under uh, uh, the attack was the concept of physical change. And of course, how can you do physics if you do not uh, allow any uh, status for the concept of change? And this man is called Parmenides of Elia. He wrote a very long philosophical poem, not particularly beautiful, but very rigorous. In this poem, he says that what is, is, and what is not, is not. It's very familiar, and everything which doesn't have such a clear status is a dubious entity and is to be rejected by uh, clear-minded, solid philosophers. So rejected is the concept of change, because change is precisely this, when something first is and then is not, or the other way. So it seems that the concept of change is self-contradictory, and so is any kind of description of the world around us, which is based on the concept of change, very dangerous. The concept of space probably also goes. Maybe not completely, though, because when Parmenides describes what he thinks should stand as the principle of philosophy, and that is the principle of being, as he calls it, what is, is, and this is what we should only be allowed to say, that it is. But then he describes and he gives a list of several attributes of being, which are such that it never comes to be, it is eternal, it is ungenerated, it is indivisible, and then he says, and it is uh, probably uh, like, in, like a form of sphere, which is equal on all sides. So there is a spatial image involved in the description of this very, very abstract initial concept. So maybe there is room for space still, even in such a non-physical uh, doctrine, uh, which Parmenides offered. Parmenides is considered the first metaphysician, and rightly so. Now, Parmenides' student Zeno of Elia is much more familiar to all of us because he invented uh, Zeno's paradoxes, and everyone should know them. I think everyone has heard about Achilles and the turtle, and the stadium probably. Some people have heard about moving rows. And all these paradoxes were invented by Zeno in order to defend the strange theory of his teacher uh, Parmenides, the uh, theory of uh, the one which is being. So uh, Zeno invented his paradoxes in order to show precisely that the concepts of notion, the concepts of multiplicity are paradoxical. Our thinking is misled when we are engaging ourselves in such discussions. We are just on the wrong track and should stop doing it. And of course, this was found very uh, challenging, tantalizing by people up to now. And, but the less known, probably less glamorous, let's say, paradox of Zeno, which is more relevant to our today's discussion, is his paradox of place. This paradox says, just simply, that if uh, somehow place itself is something that exists, then it should be somewhere, because everything that ex if everything that exists is in place, then place is also something that, that exists, and it also should be in place. If so, then that means that we are getting into the infinite regress, and again, we are on the wrong track. So this paradox was uh, found very, very challenging by many uh, later philosophers of nature. Philosophers of nature were picked. They started inventing responses to um, Zeno's paradoxes immediately. There were several different schools of uh, philosophers of nature. They all came up with their own responses. And we can see in the fragments of their work, which are extant to us, that they are explicitly replying to this challenge. So they're not just philosophizing out of blue air, but they have heard uh, the message of the Eleatic school, and they're trying to do better. Um, uh, the, one of the most famous replies to uh, the paradox of Zeno is the reply uh, uh, which is uh, provided by the school of Greek atomists. And uh, the Greek atomists decide to bite the bullet and say uh, that they are going to uh, allow for the uh, two kinds of entity. The, uh, there will be something that is, that will be atoms, and then there will be something that is not, that is the void. Void is space, that is something in which the atoms move. In this way, we have two metaphysical entities, 
which uh, kind of allow us to complete the picture of the physical world without ever breaking the law of contradiction, because we accept all the premises of Parmenides, we just sort of decide to do it slightly differently and say that we have the small bits of being, which are uh, scattered throughout a huge, huge uh, uh, space of uh, not being and uh, the recombination of atoms and recombination was the key reply of all physicists to the paradox of uh, to the paradoxes of Zeno and Parmenides challenge because they said we should think of change just as a recombination of uh, the existent entities and um, uh, in this way atomism is a part of this general trend so we have something that is and then nothing disappears, nothing breaks the law of contradiction. We just get new complex entities out of the simpler ones. This is a familiar uh, later reductionist program, which is also a product of ancient Greek thought. Now we uh, are going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about Plato of Athens, a famous philosopher, obviously, who had his own response to Parmenides. It was a different response because Plato came from a slightly different uh, camp. He was big friends with mathematicians, and uh, uh, at some point in his career, a group of mathematicians, uh, which included such famous figures as Theotetus, Archytas of Tarentum, started meeting together with Plato in a particular grove in the outskirts of Athens, which was devoted to uh, the hero Hecademus or Academus, and then that's where the word academia comes from. That was the first academia and they were just discussing the problems of mathematics and philosophy and that's how the uh, philosophy of Plato took shape. Uh, the key feature of this philosophy is that the explanation of the world is to be gained on the basis of indeed unchangeable eternal principles which they called forms. In fact we translate them as forms. The Greek word eidos means kind. So there are certain kinds which uh, provide uh, robust, good explanations of physical phenomena and things in the sensible world which are subject to all those vices described by Parmenides about the wrong methodological thinking. So the change happens to sensible things and forms themselves are the uh, sort of uh, things of which the sensible things partake really. They are mirror images, they are just uh, temporary existence and because of this mixed nature of the sensible things they are subject to the destruction and they cannot constitute a proper object of science. A science should study not those uh, small and uh, misleading side tracks but should study the key principles which are behind these uh, physical events. This is Plato. Now, uh, in the dialogue Timaeus, it is a very famous dialogue and sort of very much poeticized and I put a piece of art, it's William Blake actually, to uh, depict the creation of the cosmos. So this uh, is, uh, the dialogue Timaeus was probably used in Plato's academy when it already became a proper philosophical school as a textbook of physics. It describes how the world came to be. And uh, the main figure, the much poeticized figure there, is the figure of the demiurge. The demiurge means master craftsman. Uh, in, in fact, in Plato's Republic, the third class of uh, uh, craftsmen is they are demiurgoi. So it is a very ordinary word, perhaps. And uh, Plato's demiurge is uh, probably a metaphor for an ideal thinker. So we have an ideal thinker who looks at all the core principles and takes the most important principles, making good rational theoretical choices. And on the basis of these good rational theoretical choices, he constructs something which we would describe today as a model of the physical world. But, but uh, uh, at the, in Plato's time, it was the other way around. It was a copy of the original best perfect rational selection of the key principles, key explanatory principles. So this is what the Demiurge does. He looks at the forms. He takes three main forms. The three main forms are called being, same, and different. So you can say that ancient philosophers are like us today. They're doing things which are very little intelligible. Uh, then there are certain manipulations in the course of which uh, the demiurge puts 
three forms into a mixing bowl and mixes them all together to make them into one. Then he acts, it, it looks almost like a recipe. Then you take uh, your mixture, which is one. It is uh, uh, somehow divided into uh, several uh, uh, mathematical, mathematically guided portions. And there is a mathematics uh, behind this. And all this uh, inclusion of forms, inclusion of mathematics for Plato, uh, fulfills a purely philosophical task, but what he is really creating is something that he calls world soul. The shape of the world soul looks like an amillary sphere. This is a very imprecise commercial image of an amillary sphere. It is the structure of the visible cosmos. So uh, the visible cosmos is construed from the mixture, where you take two stripes out of your mixture, and they are already preordained in accordance with the mathematical proportions. Here Plato has all the proportions. We have two uh, short geometrical progressions which are put together by one scholar in the form of a musical sequence. And then uh, at the next stage here, where my uh, cursor is, there is a, an insertion of the arithmetical and harmonic means between every two successive quasi-tones of this musical scale. And in this way, we exhaust mathematically all our uh, sort of mixture, and out of this mixture we make two circles. One of them is the circle of the same, and the other is the circle of the different. So these two circles here, are the circle of the same is this meridian of our um, universe, and uh, the circle of the different is, of course, the ecliptic circle. All this uh, information is plugged into this in order to satisfy various philosophical principles for which Plato cares. But for us today, I think it is important to notice that actually the, this philosophical construction of the universe already starts setting the shape of the universe as a geometrical shape. And this geometrical shape is, of course, based on the astronomical data and it is uh, really a, a construction of something like an astronomical instrument. In, in fact, this, despite, despite a lot of poetry in this part of the dialogue of Timaeus, the story about the demiurge does remind the reader a little bit about the Greek technical treatises, where we have some of them, which are devoted, for instance, to the design of the astrolabe, to the design of, uh, for instance, in uh, Ptolemy's uh, planetary hypothesis, we have the, just how to make something. The theory is kept to the minimum, but it's a very important theory because, of course, uh, this is what is going to play the main role in our observations. And um, this is what, um, uh, and the steps are described with great precision so as to satisfy this theory. So um, this is uh, the first approach we, we might label of Plato to the problem of space. Initially, he just takes the astronomical space and uh, reconstructs it geomet its geometry in a way which makes it already a set space for the cosmos. Then there is uh, something which is usually regarded as a philosophical problem of space in Plato. That is uh, uh, an entity which is called the receptacle. It is an unusual word, and the Greek there is also very unusual. Plato is uh, using uh, uh, difficult language because the ideas which he's trying to express are very difficult. He needs to explain. How, because, you know, I've, as I showed you this, um, uh, um, this amylary sphere, but we need to understand that this amylary sphere that Plato is talking about is invisible. It is sort of, it doesn't have any physical properties. It's just an illustration here. But really, he's talking about the real physical world. So we are now to find a way for all the elements which compose our physical world to take their place in this amylary sphere. And this is where we need something else. We need something more than just math mathematical equations, but we need uh, the stuff which, will, which is going to satisfy those equations. And here, Plato comes up with this concept, which is the concept of the third kind. So we have the forms, we have the geometrical shape of the world, and then there is something else something which is totally uh, uh, deprived of every kind of uh, qualitative um, 
um, qualifications. It is just something which is uh, receptive of various qualities. And uh, this is something that Plato calls the wet nurse of the universe. It is the receptacle. And this is uh, also, as many scholars point out, something which serves for a concept of space for Plato. The receptacle is something which, is, which cannot be described in any particular way. This is, uh, you can see that this is slightly familiar from already Aperon's, uh, uh, Anaximander's description of Aperon. But uh, in the case of the receptacle, uh, Plato pays attention to point out that um, the uh, uh, receptacle has a quasi-physical nature. So it is not uh, just some purely originative material, but it is something which is uh, subject to certain kinds of disorderly motions. He compares those disorderly motions to the turbulence which is created by a farmer when he is slightly shaking the sieve. So this shaking motions of the sieve produce the, the effect that the heavier particles in the sieve concentrate in the middle and the lighter particles go uh, on the uh, sides. So there is some kind of very, very minimal ordering which happens already in the, uh, at the receptacle stage. So this receptacle is uh, uh, highly malleable and this is something which can take on the elemental forms. So here, I think I'm going to skip some of the uh, uh, text and just talk a little bit about the elemental forms, which are the forms of the five geometrical solids. They are sometimes called five platonic solids, and they represent, for Plato, uh, the four elements, the fifth of these solids is left uh, temporarily jobless. Plato considers the idea of assigning it to the whole cosmos, but then drops it. The uh, tetrahedron corresponds to fire. And uh, this correspondence is uh, based on the uh, perceived equivalence of the geometrical properties with, with some of the physical effects they can produce. So because the pyramid is, uh, has such sharp angles, it can act uh, in, in the action of cutting, and this is what fire does when it sort of consumes the combustible materials. It's, it's just that its atoms cut into uh, those materials. Then we have cube, which is the most stable, uh, most solid, and that corresponds to the earth. We have uh, octahedron, which is uh, like two pyramids put uh, one onto another, they correspond to the air, which is uh, slightly heavier but almost like fire. And then we have dodecahedron, that, that is water. So these are kind of types. The discussion of where, where the geometrical types belong is a famous discussion, in, um, and it's still an unresolved question in Platonic scholarship. But uh, what we need to know is that uh, this uh, goo of uh, the receptacle can take on those tiny little geometrical shapes. It takes them on not in a perfect manner, not in a terribly consistent manner. They come in different sizes. And uh, in fact, um, the uh, processes uh, are made regular by the regular motions of the cosmos. So it is the cosmos uh, as a whole which is created by Demiurge as a rational model which provides the rationality, consistency, regularity to all the laws of physics. And yet we have something like matter and space, matter or space. Um, again, there is a lot of debate on how we should interpret the receptacle, which is something that provides an underlying substrate, something Plato says that needs to be persuaded by the rational laws. And uh, this is uh, uh, somehow Plato's very, very long, it's a very long dialogue, very long explanation of how our physical cosmos can be conceived of as rational and yet still physical. Now, uh, Plato's student Aristotle, this is the, uh, probably the sort of the most influential philosopher in academic philosophy. Um, uh, throughout the late antiquity and middle ages, is a very solid analytical mind. He is like modern analytical philosophers. He approaches the concept of space very, very carefully. He distinguishes between place and the where. He, in, the, in his list of categories, he has the category pu, which means where. And that's different from the physical category of place. 
and he criticizes Plato's account of meta space because he thinks that it confuses some elements which shouldn't be confused. And instead, he offers his own very, uh, also not, a, not an easy interpretation of uh, space. Now, because, of, because we're running out of time, I'm starting using the lecture streaks. And usually what I do when I start explaining this difficult material to the students is I use one of these or such gloves. And I'm telling them, that, uh, imagine now that this glass glove is just made of air, which is adjacent to my hand. You can see that according to Aristotle, the place is uh, the inner side of the adjacent air. <laughs> so if you take this glove, it has the red inside, very convenient. So the red part, kind of, if we marked it theoretically as red, would be Aristotle's place. So the place is the inner surface of the adjacent body for Aristotle. That is his first definition, and then he makes correction in the course of his argument, which brings out a whole host of discussion, saying that it is also immobile. It is a very difficult, counterintuitive concept of place. It is much criticized. People think that it cannot explain any, anything which has to do with locomotion. We don't know why he even uh, uh, develops it and, and how it combines with his uh, theory of the cosmos. Because, uh, so the, uh, the uh, Aristotle's example, for instance, of place uh, of a boat in a river is that uh, somehow the, re the, the boat which is moved in the river has as its place the inner surface of the adjacent water, but the water is of course in the river, is constantly flowing. So it seems that there has to be some problem with the constitution of this place and the problem of uh, this predicate of immobile becomes particularly tangible here. And Aristotle says here, even more enigmatically, that it is the whole of the river that should be construed as the place, because that is immobile. So this is a real puzzle which, caused, which exercised philosophers throughout late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And just as if that was not enough, Aristotle also has a theory of natural places. This is the uh, theory <coughs> which describes the dynamics of the four elements. The four elements are the periodic system in Greek physics, the earth, air, fire, water. Aristotle has a qualitative theory of the elements, and according to him, the, he has a proof of the elements in his work, which is called On the Heavens, where the discussion of the elements is conducted in terms of weight. So the, uh, unlike, he disapproves of Plato's geometrical theory of elements. He thinks we should be qualita qualitativists, but he still thinks that qualitative properties such as hot, for instance, can be set in correspondence with uh, the dynamic properties such as uh, weight and lightness. So the hot and dry uh, fire is the lightest element, and that means in Aristotle's system that it is the most centripetal element. It is the element which is always wanting to go upwards. So uh, it is uh, sort of, if we could compare it very, very uh, tentatively with modern concept of gravitation, we would say that Aristotle has both gravitation and levitation. So gravitation is the tendency of the earth and water to go downwards, and the levitation is the tendency of fire and air to go upwards. In this way, we get kind of an orderly distribution of the elements in the atmosphere, and uh, these uh, places, in the cosmos, which the elements take when they are allowed to. Most of the time they're not allowed to because they're bound in chemical combinations, but when they're set free, they can go where their nature lies, and that will be their natural places. This is Aristotle's, uh, he uses the concept of place then. And uh, uh, the question, of course, is whether uh, Aristotle is being uh, even uh, consistent with his theory in physics, and probably we should be charitable to Aristotle and try to conceive of the theory of layered places in accordance with his theory of physics. In that case, what we get will be not a theory of the absolute place for which Aristotle is, uh, absolute space, for which Aristotle is often made responsible in quick surveys like mine. But uh, in my quick survey, I just want to uh, pay attention to the fact 
that uh, in Aristotle's system, uh, space is really never detached from the dynamics of the cosmos. So uh, spatial characteristics are at the same time also the dynamic characteristics. And um, unfortunately, uh, we have to stop here. I had a number of other uh, interesting thinkers which we now have to skip. And just to intrigue you a little bit more, uh, uh, I want to tell you about the latest philosopher the, in my uh, series, who is a Neoplatonist, very well read in both Plato and Aristotle, who proposed his own theory of place as light. And uh, in this last text, he uh, suggests that we imagine two spheres. One is the cosmic sphere, uh, the way we know it in the ancient cosmos, i.e. finite uh, sphere uh, surrounded by the heavens, and another will be the sphere of light. And if we place the cosmic sphere, our cosmos, within the sphere of light, then that will be the most natural description of the cosmos being in a place. So uh, in this way, we kind of had a very, very uh, uh, tentative but a uh, story of ancient philosophy running through various concepts of space from the original chaos to light in Proclus. And uh, uh, my main um, task in this story was to emphasize that at no point, uh, except perhaps in the atomist physics, do we really have a pure case of absolute space. In each case, uh, space is, some, is a complex concept and it is made somehow dependent on various dynamic features of the physical systems. We see that in Plato, we see that in Aristotle, and we see that in many thinkers after Aristotle I cannot talk about. But thank you very much for your um, attention. So now we have 15 minutes for questions, and there will be two microphones going okay, around the room. Sorry, just probably shouldn't remove them. So you've talked about Aristotle's five propositions, and you also mentioned that uh, he was much likely as analytical philosophy these days. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to know if we can refer to Aristotle's first propositions as the origins of the set theory that was later set up by logicians such as Bertrand Russell in the 20th century. Uh -huh. Um, so this is, um, I think that uh, probably the quick answer will be no, but that doesn't mean that uh, they're, not doing, they're not interested in the same kind of thing. The, uh, Aristotle is very careful in his methodology not to say that Russell was not. It's just uh, that when we're talking about Aristotle's ontology, we start um, from the uh, discussion of problems a priori which is uh, not very typical of the tradition of analytical philosophy. Uh, and not because they didn't discuss the problems, but just because they wanted to kind of define their core concepts before they start discussing anything for clarity. And Aristotle thought that we can, in order to achieve clarity, we first need, he was a student of Plato, and Plato probably already achieved enough clarity with himself to confuse everyone, so they just put all, the, all their achievements in two columns and made them, uh, showed where they kind of disagree and tried to work out uh, the nature of disagreement that was important for Aristotle. For the, for the early 20th century philosophers, for Bertrand Russell and for Vienna's circle, it was slightly less uh, important because they had many things on which they were agreed and they were challenged by the problems raised in the field, for instance, in, of philosophy of mathematics. So it is, there are very, very many similarities, but there are also some differences there. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so you said something just at the end of your talk that I found very intriguing, which is that um, there was no such thing as absolute space, even in Aristotle's philosophy. Could you just say a bit more about that? Because was, we, you know, we're used to the conception yes. that for Aristotle, there was a distinguished location, the mm -hmm. centre of the of the Earth, and you might think mm -hmm. that that is sort of all you need, really. Yes, well, definitely. I mean, that, that's. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for this question. I was sort of hoping to get some resistance <laughs> to to that because, the, uh, well, it's true that uh, Aristotle's cosmos is very fixed. It is almost like Plato's and worse, because Aristotle doesn't believe in forms. 
So he wants his elements just to go to the places where Aristotle, where Plato thinks the elements will go not out of their own internal nature, but just because they're compelled to do so by the A, the geometrical space of the cosmos, and B, by the properties of the receptacle, which will be so, sort of nudging them uh, to, n to sort of take particular paths in this. So their ultimate distribution in the cosmos is directed from several angles, whereas Aristotle just tells us, oh, they, they have those qualities and this is your cosmos. Yet, uh, I think he sort of, it wasn't his aim to prescribe this kind of picture. He aimed for consistency and clarity, as usual. And he wanted to make it consistent with his theory of place, which he develops in physics book form, which is a very special analytical treatise. And that definition of uh, place, which is like, like the red part of my glove, just for simplicity, has to agree, has, has to agree with the picture of absolute space that we have um, in the other cosmological treatises. It's not a very easy agreement, but it seems to me that it can be made. So if you, uh, at least one of the medieval thinkers who probably worked hard on that <laughs> and maybe also thought that that could be made was St. Thomas Aquinas. He also thought that we can analyze our universe into as many layers of containers as we like. And in that way, everything will fall into place even if we accept, we don't start with the kind of absolute space, and it's not the goal to find absolute space. In some way, it is also uh, ultimately a combination of several factors which makes the cosmic space uh, construed as ultimately as uh, absolute. But in the beginning, we have just place, and everything is in its place, and the elements are in their place, and the way they interact in those places brings it about that they occupy the places in the universe which are their natural places. For instance, Aristotle's um, uh, success, not immediate success, is the third scholar of the uh, Aristotelian school called Strato of Lampsacus. He had a nickname in antiquity, Fusikos, which meant that he was not just, everyone was a natural philosopher, but he was a, like, a physicist. So he just decided to rewrite Aristotle's theory completely, getting rid of the concept of natural place and just saying that uh, we have the mechanism of expulsion. So it is uh, sort of uh, the um, Archimedes force which sort of pushes the uh, elements, the lighter elements on top and sort of makes the heavier sink. And he thought that we get exactly the same results as in Aristotle without ever needing his concepts of absolute space. Nonetheless, uh, what's interesting is that he didn't uh, somehow, um, um, he was still working in the same cosmic paradigm and he accepted very different concepts of uh, place. He, he was somebody who uh, voted for the three-dimensional uh, space and uh, so on. So it seems uh, somehow that the problem that he resolves with his approach is not the problem with Aristotle's definition of place in the physics, but the problem with the type of cosmos that Aristotle is trying to describe. And sort of I'm wondering to what extent the problem of absolute space in our today's perception is more the problem of the Greek cosmos, which is a closed cosmos, and uh, which by shortcut we can very easily describe as something which is an absolute space, and not the thinking of the Greek philosophers themselves, who probably fully realized all these same problems, but just sort of did their best to uh, devise different strategies in resolving them. And uh, just, uh, my, my task was to just show how complex the strategies were and how it was never really the uh, aim of uh, Aristotle, say, to get this distribution of weights, say. And absolute space, you know, I think that uh, if you look at Epicurus, and atomists, that's your absolute space, as much of it as it can be, it's void. It is just totally uh, very, very modern sounding, modern in the sense of classical physics, of course, it's just sort of totally uh, isotropic and it's three-dimensional, it has certain dynamic properties also for Epicurus because the only kind of motion we have in Epicurus is the downward motion of atoms, but uh, still it is uh, something which is very little connected with the uh, geometry of the cosmos uh, as we know it. <laughs>
I was actually going to ask two questions, a complex one and a simple one, but given the time constraint, I think I'll just stick with the simple one. You've given us an excellent romp uh, through Greek philosophy from Hesiod to uh, Proclus. Um, it's a very simple question. Do you have a favorite and why? Uh, well, I would say Aristotle, um, uh, because he's the most boring <laughs> and <laughs> sort of the, the most prepared to go any length in sort of disentangling the argument and sort of not, not, not looking for easy ways, maybe. That would be. Yeah. It's a pedagogical question, actually. Um, because you mentioned, I mean, you, you say you, when you show to your students, you use the glove because, of course, there's a, there's they, a challenge they, in... They were bewildered. Do you have physicists among your students? No. Okay. Mainly, mainly philosophers. Okay. Because I'd be very right. curious to see how a contemporary, like, yeah. a, you know, a, de a student of it's, contemporary I'm, physics would approach this. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm sure I some of them I, I, have been... I welcome challenges. I mean, if, if you want to contest <laughs> that, <I'm laughs> I'd be very grateful so, so that that will save me embarrassment next time. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Hi, um, thank you very much for, for your talk. Which of these um, conceptual frameworks would you say is closest to mm. our contemporary sort of relativity-based idea of relativity. space geometry? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question because it, it depends on which aspect of relativity uh, we are talking about. So, which which aspect of relativity is of interest? Uh, in the, okay. sorry, m mostly to do with geometry of of of, of space time and and, mm -hmm. and the idea of free fall and how this mm -hmm. sort of compares with the void and mm -hmm. so Aristotle's idea of things tendency mm -hmm. going up or going down, how that sort of, you know, plays mm -hmm. against the ideas of free fall and, 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 yeah, and sort of, yeah. That is, uh, that is you know, uh, somehow, I think I've seen even uh, recently some papers by physicists vindicating Aristotle. For Aristotle didn't, somehow Aristotle criticized the idea of free fall he thought that it is obvious that, of course, the heavier uh, objects are uh, uh, moving faster and uh, the lighter objects are moving slower. And, of course, he didn't have vacuum the benefit of vacuum tube experiments. So, but the Epicureans could come to the same idea even without any vacuum tubes. They just had that very, very... Uh, interesting insight about the motion of atoms, which, of course, uh, they insisted that uh, is not something that could ever be tested in any experiment. Because the Epicurus was also, unfortunately, we didn't have time, but Epicurus was a very, very careful uh, methodological thinker. But uh, in terms of, so in that sense, of course, uh, uh, Aristotle should look backwards. But if you think of uh, other aspects of his analysis, just look at his analysis of uh, the argument against the free fall, and you will see that he's analyzing more the interaction of the uh, elements, not the, the interaction of the bodies, let's say, in accordance with uh, how he understands that. In the physicist paper that I read, the defense was on the lens that he was studying the mechanisms of friction. And uh, which is, of course, fair enough if you <laughs> think of air present. And uh, sort of, I, I cannot speak on behalf of physicists, but uh, that's uh, at least one line of uh, conceptualizing that. And you know, in terms of just uh, relativity, just to finish the point, I think definitely we should look into the late Neoplatonic philosophers. What do you think of, of Proclus talking about place as light? It is. In, in modern cosmological discussions, I think we should at least read those texts to see how he understands that. Because Proclus is also, he's not, um, of course he is a poet, but he's also a mathematician. He wrote a commentary on Euclid. He's, he's a very, very serious uh, sort of philosopher. So definitely he has a very interesting argument for that. Last Hello. Hey. <laughs> well, firstly, thank you very much for your talk. You. Um, you talked about Zenos and Parmenides and all of these people. During the same time, we had Pythagoras talk about 
three-dimensional uh, sort of forms and elements like you line up three cuboids and you form a, a structure around it. So according to you, to what extent did Pythagoras influence uh, uh, the notion of space, not just in ancient Greek philosophy or the Socratic and post times, mm -hmm. but in, 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 in the times of today, how, how do you think Pythagoras has influenced our, mm -hmm. our vision or our understanding of space? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. It's an, it's an excellent question. Of course, I should have said at least something about Pythagoras. Well, but the, uh, you see, because I'm a philosopher also, the, uh, and historian of philosophy, the first thing that every historian of philosophy will tell you about Pythagoras is that we know so little. Uh, and that is true. The, we have very little text, uh, textual evidence for Pythagoras himself. We have a lot of material uh, which show his huge influence in antiquity. And there, are, uh, there is a period where there is an upsurge of Platonic Pythagorean texts in the Hellenistic period. One very interesting uh, text is a forgery, actually, which pretends to be, which is calling its, uh, itself Archytas, but it is, we call it pseudo Archytas. It chooses the name of Archytas, who I mentioned. He was a friend of Plato, and uh, he was one of his early uh, sort of, not co-founders, but co, uh, just co-conveners co co of those academic talks to begin with, and a head of mathematical and philosophical um, school in uh, uh, Sicily. And uh, he's uh, somebody who is, um, probab it is right to consider him as a Pythagorean, but he's a very serious philosopher. His uh, mathematician and uh, uh, his sort of uh, develop, developing his own theories. We can't say how many of these theories go back to Pythagoras because we really we have many legends about Pythagoras. We have a good sense of his uh, community, uh, of his school as a uh, sort of ethical, maybe religious community. They definitely had a good political clout in those places where they were, that we also know from historical sources. In terms of actual teachings, there, there is there's rather little. There are le legendary attributions of famous theorems, or Pythagoras theorem, everyone has heard of. And there's, it's not unreasonable to think that they had some uh, such results, but we don't know how really they proved them. And uh, that's why it's uh, sort of not easy to speak about the man. But it's, it's a little bit easier to speak about the tradition, because the tradition of mathematical philosophy is hugely influential. Plato is the first case of such influence, and everyone else after. One uh, uh, particular theory of space which I was going to mention in connection with pseudo archytas was the theory according to which space has causal properties. And that is also connected with some of the uh, some of the very unclear statements attributed to the old Pythagoras about the cosmic breath and such things. So uh, it is really uh, something which uh, makes us think about uh, hypothesizing mathematical concepts and sort of making them a part of already physical framework of the cosmos. That is. Um, probably the line of Pythagorean influence which can be traced in the later texts. That's, that's the best I can. I guess that's all I have for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanking Dr. Petrova. Oh, wait.